Hello everyone, and thank you for joining us on the last day of the Housing Forum. We have a great session for you with four diverse and very knowledgeable speakers. My name is Alejandro Krell. I'm the Managing Director of Paladin Realty Partners, a private equity firm investing institutional capital in affordable housing construction projects throughout Latin America. It is an honor to be moderating this panel, especially given the gravity of the issue at hand. You know, when I need to remind myself of the scale of the housing shortage, I do a simple math exercise. Based on today's global population and its annual growth rate, we should be building shelter for 44,000 new households or families per day, not weeks or months or years, per day. We're certainly not meeting this huge increase in demand, but fortunately, People like yourselves are focused on finding ways to scale up new housing opportunities and solutions, not only in technology, construction materials and systems, but also in entrepreneurship and capital sourcing. Now we will listen to four professionals representing a diverse perspective on how to address this large scale global affordable housing dilemma. But before doing so, on a housekeeping note, I would like to remind everyone that you have the opportunity after the presentations to ask questions to our panel. You may actually send your comments and questions through the chat and we'll address them at the end of the session. So without further delay, let me introduce you to our first guest. Johan Barr is Director of Affordable Housing and Technology at Healthy Foundation, part of the Healthy Corporation headquartered in Liechtenstein a construction tool manufacturer with 30,000 employees in 120 countries and coincidentally turning 80 years old in 2021, this year. Please go ahead, Johan. The Hilti Foundation is a joint venture of the Hilti family and the Hilti Corporation, a leading global provider of technology-leading products, systems and services to the construction industry. As a philanthropic organization based in Liechtenstein, Europe, it is our aim to contribute to the development of society. We thereby set priorities on countries of the Global South. What unites our activities across all program areas and regions is the objective to empower people to lead an independent and self-determined life. The program area Affordable Housing and Technology supports these objectives with its ambition to discover improve and scale technical innovation for the construction of safe and affordable homes, which serve as a starting point into a better life for families from disadvantaged backgrounds. While being a classic grant-making organization, our mission statement sets one important strategic objective. We follow a clear scale perspective in all programs supported. By this, we clearly mean solutions that work on a national scale that get replicated across entire regions, that change how systems work. Can a classical grant with all its limitations really achieve this level of scale? Grants, especially when issued by private foundations, usually are limited to a certain smaller size of investment, limited in time and scope, focused on one specific project or solution it may not reflect the entire complexity of a social challenge. And we all know that social challenges are really complex to deal with. At the Hilti Foundation, we are convinced that a grant, despite of its limitations, has a clear role in reaching scale, both socially and economically. I would like to support this case by three statements and examples from our work and we'll be happy to discuss them further during the session and during the rest of the forum. Statement one, as a private foundation, we focus on early stage innovation or pilot projects. This is to bring solutions to the edge of the table where large scale donors and investors start to get interested. Grant money, in my view, is ideal for this purpose, mainly because of two reasons. One, as a private foundation, we are willing and prepared to take calculated risk. While obviously there are rules that regulate our work, we are not bound by political mandates, donor provisions, or the taxpayer's critical eye in selecting our interventions. We spend our own money for projects and solutions that we feel promise the largest impact and scale. And second, 
investing grant money means that we do not expect a financial return on investment. If a model proves successful, we connect with other larger donors or investors who bring the solution to scale. If it takes longer to prove success, we can decide to stay the course. And if an innovation does not prove successful, it is our decision to take it as a lesson learned. Our Cocoa Boards are one great example of such early stage investment. Back in 2012, we offered a grant to the Bern University of Applied Sciences to develop a fiber board made from coconut husks as a green and local solution for low cost construction in the Philippines. With some ups and downs, the project was brought to a point at which a strong product had been developed, conversations with local production partners were well advanced, and a clear business plan was defined. At this point, the Bern University of Applied Sciences decided to create a spin-off that since its start has won various awards which support ventures in launching and scaling their solutions. For us, this was a great moment in time to leave direct support to others and to terminate our grant. Statement two, as a private foundation, we invest in enabling environments. A grant obviously is not made to provide capital to businesses to scale their operations in the market. But a grant can be a powerful tool to support scale beyond the early investment stage. This happens, in my view, when we start to join forces and create coalitions for change in which everyone, while pursuing the same objective, contributes what they are best at. With a grant, a private foundation can ensure that a solution is embedded in an environment in which it really creates the in intended impact at scale. A grant, for example, can be invested in a training program for a given target group to make sure a solution is accepted and applied. A grant may also be invested to install a favorable policy environment. Or we invest a grant into the creation of a local value chain so that not only the specific solution is brought to scale, but that an entire local ecosystem is impacted in a positive manner. And there are many, other, many more options to invest grant money in a reasonable way to support impact at a large scale. As an example, let me refer to the Philippines again. In 2014, we started to build homes for families in need using a technology which was developed by Hilti engineers, which uses local bamboo as its sole structural element, which is proven disaster resistant and comes at a cost within the social housing standards of most developing countries. Until 2018, we had completed almost 1,000 homes across the entire country and understood this as a proof of concept. So we invited others, including Habitat for Humanity, to join forces with us and to use our technology to build homes for families in need at a large scale. Today, we do not invest in the construction of homes anymore, but we continue to support the scale up. We continue to invest in research and development. In fact, we opened a bamboo innovation center in Manila this year we continue to invest in the training of local builders with accredited training programs. We work with local farmers to help grow the local bamboo industry. And we work with the national government to include bamboo as a building material into the national building code. Statement three, as a private foundation, we invest in sustainable networks for change. At the Hilti Foundation, we are convinced that one solution alone one project by itself will not be able to create sustainable social change and certainly not at a large scale. It needs coalitions and networks of partners with various strengths and backgrounds who join forces and pool their resources to find and implement the complex answers needed to address the complex realities of change. This is why we invest as a foundation, for example, in a housing forum to meet and discuss the gaps and opportunities in making solutions work. But conferences are just one tool among many to foster connectivity within the sector. In my view, one important aspect of our engagement is that we actively form coalitions of partners who drive tangible solutions in the field. We are convinced that this is a meaningful contribution to finding holistic answers 
and to make change happen at a large scale by investing grant money. We started to engage in the formation of such coalitions in 2010, when we joined forces with Swiss Contact for the Construya project in Colombia. The idea was simple. We wanted to train informal and self-managed builders in informal settlements in better construction practices to improve the structural safety in these neighborhoods. For this purpose, we invested into the creation of public-private partnerships in which training content is being developed by public institutions and private partners from the construction sector use the content to implement campaigns and courses. In this way, more than 600,000 citizens have been sensitized until today, and more than 30,000 builders receive training. And I'm proud to say that even beyond the scope of our engagement, 21 partners decided to continue their collaboration to implement trainings for informal and self-managed builders when our grant was terminated last year. I hope I was able to make an argument for the role of grant-making foundations in scaling social and economic impact. I certainly could spend another five minutes or more to discuss the specific role of corporate foundations in this context, but we may want to leave this to another occasion. Thank you. Thank you, Johan, for your thoughts, great leadership, and the generous grants that the Healthy Foundation is providing across the globe. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Mauri Pisania, the Executive Director of Artemisia, based in Sao Paulo, who will provide her perspective on the great challenges facing Brazil, the largest country and economy in Latin America. First of all, I'd like to thank Habitat for International for this invitation. My name is Mauri Pessain and I work in Artemisia, a nonprofit organization that develops and accelerates social impact business in Brazil. I'm here to share an initiative that we are co-creating to address housing problems in the country. Just to give you a little bit of context, Brazil has big challenges in terms of housing and housing plays a central role in the lives of low-income family. In addition to the house playing an important role as an asset, the conditions of the house and the neighborhood where you're living directly influence the health and quality of life of its inhabitants. Some of the main challenges faced by Brazilian population are 7.7 .7 million is the size of housing deficit in Brazil. I'm talking about precarious housing, cohabitation, excessive rent burden and excessive density. 91% of the housing deficit is concentrated in families earning less than three minimum ages and 7.2 million households without adequate access to urban infrastructure. The four basic infrastructure services are not yet universal and present challenges, especially when we look at the low-income population. The issues related to water and sanitation are structural knots that make it difficult to fight the coronavirus, for example. Only 55% of the population has adequate sanitation. Almost 100 million people use alternative measures to deal with the problem. Also, 85% of Brazilian population lives in urban areas. Uh, as the city, as the Italian urban planner Marcelo Babo wrote, is breaking up into different fragments with the upper information of microstates. Rich neighborhoods endowed with all kinds of services, such as exclusive schools, golf courses, tennis courts, with all kinds of services, uh, private security patrolling the area 24 hours a day, lives together with slums without sanitations, where the electricity is pirated by a privileged few, the streets turn torrents of mud when it rains, and shared housing is the norm. Each of these fragments seems to live and function autonomously, holding firmly to what it has managed to grasp in the daily struggle for survival. There is a complete absence of public policies in one hand, and on the other, the problem is too big for civil society organizations to resolve. Um, but is it possible to create business solutions to address housing problems? How can we show and inspire entrepreneurs that we need them in order to innovate and create scalable solutions to housing problems? And in 2008, Artemisia, the organization that I work with, 
we raised these questions, but it took almost 10 years to create partnerships that were willing to help us. Um, so finally, in 2018, Artemisia, we created a coalition to develop an entrepreneurial ecosystem to solve and help to solve housing problems. One strategy, our strategy is based in two main pillars. The, the first one is a platform for innovation and the second one is awareness. In one size, we are trying to find and develop early stage ideas and scales proven technology and business models to be adopted by the market. And the other size, we are producing and sharing, sharing knowledge to raise awareness and engage key actors. To raise awareness, one of our main strategies was to create a social impact thesis focusing in housing. It was prepared with the objective of mapping the main housing challenge that the population of low income population faces and presenting opportunities for the development of social impact business that can bring improvement to the life of these people. The thesis has been used by entrepreneurs, teachers, students, public managers, investment funds, and even journalists. We have been working together to create a better coverage of the housing issue in Brazil. Uh, the thesis is in our website and it's free for download. In our platform for innovation pillar, we are mapping and selecting, us and, selecting and accelerating companies in 10 main areas. The first one is access to housing. The second one, access to microcredit specific to housing, home improvement solutions, employability solutions that can help raise employability rates in the construction sector, water and sanitation, innovation in construction, electricity, popular housing management solutions, property solutions or land, reg land regulation solutions, and urban infrastructure and public space improvement. Since 2018, we analyzed over 1,900 businesses, but the most important, we saw our pipeline grow almost 300%. We had three accelerator cohorts helping to develop 46 companies with 46% women as founding partners. To illustrate our work, I'd like to bring three examples. The first one is Arquitetas da Vila that offer architectural services for renovation in a low cost model, but including technical assistance, labor, material and financing payment in 30 times. The second one is Revolucionar, the first solar energy cooperative in slums in Brazil that promotes sustainable development of communities through solar energy installations, professional training of scholars and educational activities. The third example is Biosaneamento that provides biodigester for vulnerable areas with small modular infrastructure to be implemented in any land and treat sewage without chemical addition. What do these three examples have in common? There are three companies created with the intention of solving housing problems. We believe that we will need many companies like Arquitetos da Vila, Revolu Solar or Biosaneamento to create a new industry, a new industry that puts the housing needs of the low income population at the center. Housing is a complex global problem and we believe that a new generation of businesses is needed to, together with the government and civil society, address it in an efficient, scalable and sustainable manner. Thank you. Thank you, Mari. Scaling up business solutions through partnerships is certainly the way to go. Before introducing our next speaker, a quick reminder to send us your questions through the chat so that we can answer them when we finish the last presentation. And now I have the pleasure of introducing Lewam Kefela who is an investment director at Village Capital based out of Northern California. I've had the pleasure of participating in two of Village Capital's accelerator programs, one in Mexico two, three years ago, and a virtual one last year for entrepreneurs in the Andean region. Please go ahead, Lewin.
Hi everyone, my name is Alam Kafella and I am an investment director at Village Capital, where I lead our early stage investment business. At Village Capital, we find, train, and invest in entrepreneurs focused on solving major world problems. We see these major world problems as market opportunities and believe that entrepreneurs are best placed to solve them. I'm so excited to join you all today and share what role we believe technology can play in solving the housing shortage in Latin America. As I'm sure we all know, there are at least 59 million people who lack adequate and affordable housing in Latin America. Only in South America's Indian region, 11.2 million families are impacted by the housing deficit caused by high land prices, informal markets, and limited access to financing. While the United Nations determines an adequate standard of living as a human right, millions of people in the region don't have a roof to put over their head or a door to lock at night. Village Capital Latin America has partnered with Habitat for Humanity's TCIS to launch accelerator programs centered on safe and affordable housing. The Andean Region Shelter Tech Accelerator is actually currently in progress and focused on entrepreneurs addressing an enormous ongoing problem in the region. In shelter tech, we feel technology can play a critical role in creating access, improving efficiency and allocation, facilitating trust, and eliminating systemic barriers to access to housing. We're seeing promising innovations that help make construction more affordable, easier, and safer, thereby addressing more directly the housing shortage that exists in Latin America. But we're also seeing promising opportunities that are a little bit more indirect, like focused on financing homes and making home ownership more accessible. We're also excited by the innovations that are surfacing that are addressing efficient allocation of existing homes, particularly targeting the rental market and targeting the people who can't afford homes. We've actually invested in a company that is focused on making housing more accessible in Latin America by removing the need for a guarantor for prospective tenants, thereby increasing access to affordable housing and increasing the potential for more upward economic mobility. I am so excited to spend some time sharing what we've learned and what we've seen and learning from fellow panelists to move this discussion forward. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Liwan. I appreciate the hard work and knowledge Village Capital brings to the table on your partnership with Habitat and TCIS. Last but not least, we will hear from Scott Merrill, Senior Director of the Terwilliger Center for Innovation and Shelter, based in Atlanta, Georgia. TCIS's Shelter Tech Accelerator Platform and Shelter Venture Fund uh, both provide much needed support for the informal and incremental housing building sector. Scott, the floor is all yours. Hi, I'm Scott Merrill with Habitat for Humanity International's Terwilliger Center for Innovation and Shelter. I'd like to introduce you to Maurizio. He owns his home and lives in Mexico City with his family of nine, including a grandchild. He has multiple sources of income and earns about $500 a month. He's interested in expanding his house to make more room for his growing extended family although finances are tight. As a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, more and more people like Maurizio are looking to expand their homes to create space for extended family returning to their ancestral home. This is particularly important because overcrowded and poorly ventilated living spaces contribute to the spread of COVID-19. A study conducted by Habitat for Humanity Mexico found that overcrowding is associated on average with 6.8 percentage point increase in the probability of dying from the disease. Unlike many middle and upper income households, homeowners like Maurizio engage in building, repairing, and improving their shelter on an informal and incremental basis. In this incremental construction process, families begin residing in a home with only the most basic features and continue to build at the pace that their finances allow. The work may start and stop as resources are available often resulting in deterioration of supplies, 
increased costs, and inconsistent quality. These incremental builders are often an invisible segment of the housing market. Even when the market is strong with a healthy supply of formal housing solutions, there are rarely products and solutions to meet the needs of incremental builders like Maurizio. As a result, these overlooked households mostly rely on informal markets to access the materials and services they need to build, repair, and improve their homes. These markets often provide substandard materials, designs, and construction methods, resulting in higher costs and potentially unsafe housing. Habitat for Humanity's Terwilliger Center for Innovation and Shelter believes that by supporting the development and testing of new environmentally friendly products, services, and business models for this invisible segment, entrepreneurs will have the flexibility to look at the challenges of the affordable housing sector in new and creative ways that benefit households and communities. Startup companies and social entrepreneurs have developed many pro-poor innovations in challenging sectors like healthcare, agriculture, and fintech. And we believe that affordable housing is ripe for disruption and innovation. This means supporting entrepreneurs like Youssef, one of the founders of Gravity. Gravity provides access to energy and appliances for families like Maurizio's by financing sustainable household appliances powered by pay-as-you-go technology. Although Youssef and Gravity started off with the mission of financing smart homes for low-income households, we find that most of the innovation in the construction sector currently focuses on the high end of the market, serving middle and upper income households in commercial construction. Incremental builders like Maurizio continue to use techniques, designs, and materials that have remained unchanged for decades. The Terwilliger Center's shelter tech platform supports shelter-based entrepreneurs like Youssef to scale their innovations to reach underserved segments of the market so that low-income households have access to improved products, services, and financing that are tailored to meet their needs. Shelter Tech is the world's leading platform for affordable housing innovation, advancing entrepreneurial solutions that can radically improve the lives of low-income families. The heart of the platform are our accelerators, which bring together shelter-focused entrepreneurs to bridge the gap between housing innovations and real-world impact. We have run Shelter Tech accelerators on four continents, and Gravity was actually a member of the first Shelter Tech Accelerator cohort in Mexico. We are currently running two virtual accelerators, including one for startups in the Andean region of South America. These virtual accelerators are designed to respond to this critical moment in history as the world increasingly recognizes the linkages between health and housing. One of the key goals of our shelter tech accelerators is to help the entrepreneurs understand the needs, aspirations, and challenges that people like Maurizio face in improving their homes. We do this through a robust curriculum and master classes with sector experts. We also help entrepreneurs like Youssef understand and test potential strategies to serve these hard to reach customers through catalytic grants. Following the outbreak of COVID-19, we provided catalytic funding to startups like Gravity to extend their runways and pivot their business models to this new reality we all face. In addition to the accelerators, through the shelter tech community, we aim to connect the more than 50 shelter tech entrepreneurs globally with investors, service providers, and industry players, including corporations, governments, and civil society organizations. Entrepreneurs receive mentorship and advice from some of these industry connections and orders from others, including governments and civil society organizations. In addition to investing over $2.5 million in 10 of these entrepreneurs through our Shelter Venture Fund, we also connect entrepreneurs to other investors and are working to help impact investors understand the opportunities for both returns and impact that can be achieved through investing in affordable housing entrepreneurs. Shelter Tech's ambitious goal is to make housing one of the top five venture philanthropy and impact investing categories by 2025. We believe that creating this enabling environment is essential to helping more entrepreneurs like Youssef serve more people like Maurizio to achieve healthier, safer, and more reliable housing. Hello, everyone. 
Well, now we're going to a Q&A session. We have about 15 minutes, and I applaud everybody that presented. Thank you very much. Uh, that was really good information. And uh, now I'm going to try to read some of the questions that have come in over the last couple of days and today. And feel free to keep uh, sending them because we are going to update uh, and try to ask as many as we can in the next uh, 15 minutes before we have to sign off. Uh, Scott, I'll start with you um, since you were the last one in. Um, specifically, how, how does TCIS leverage small initiatives and startups in housing so they can reach high scalability and sustainability? I mean, you talk about the fund, you talk about the, the accelerator. Specifically, uh, is there something you guys do to, to help scale businesses? Yeah, no, thanks for that question, Alex. You know, um, I think one of the things that we have focused on is really kind of bridging that pioneer funding gap kind of between the friends and family money that, that most people start their their businesses with um, before they get kind of the, the big first round of investments in, in, in terms of a Series A in, in investment. Um, so we do that, you know, through our own investments uh, from our Shelter Venture Fund, as well as through the catalytic grants that that you mentioned, um, and also linking them to to other investors and to other foundations in order to help um, that help extend their runway. Um, I, you know, the the other piece of it though is it's not just funding; it's also expertise, and that's where I think the accelerators and some of the mentors that that we're able to to bring in to work with those entrepreneurs is so important uh, to bring in that kind of knowledge of that affordable housing market, uh, as well as, you know, sort of more industry uh, uh, experience and, and, and particularly around kind of research and design. Great. No, that's good. That's excellent. You know, I appreciate, I appreciate the answer. Uh, I'm going to go and jump around a little bit. Um, so we make sure we have time for everybody. Uh, Maure, a question for you. Uh, that came in. How does Artemisia achieve harmonizing business profit motivation by the entrepreneurs with processes driven by social transformation to help the vulnerable populations? That's an interesting question. Well, yeah. well Alex, um, any attempt I make to give you a simple answer, I will surely fail. It's not at all simple to combine profit and impact mainly in vulnerable territories. It depends on business model, the type of service offered, the intentions of entrepreneurs and ambition of investors. Uh, on a more simplistic side, we can think that if the entrepreneur develop a solution that it, it's price, design, operation, distribution are designed directly for the vulnerable population, the more you sell, the greater your impact. It would be a direct win-win relationship. However, I think in housing, Every territory is very diverse with own dynamics, very complex dynamics and customers that will vary a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, the people that generally live on the edge of the favelas are those that have a better socioeconomic condition than those that live in the center. So you deal with more complexity mm -hmm. and the challenge is really to develop a solution that fits in the pocket of the majority. But um, many people have lost their purchase, purchasing power and cannot afford it. So there comes the creativity of the entrepreneur of developing hybrid models of services, no frills strategies, differentiate different in pricification, uh, subsidy, uh, another strategy to combine those things, profit and impact is the strategy that creating two organizations, a for-profit one or a non-profit one. And, so it's not it's not a science for sure. It depends on many things. It's kind of an art as we are seeing, but we can use those strategies. And I usually say that balancing impact and profit is not a st static balance. It's not a balance at all, but it's a more in a spiral. The intention to impact is in the center, but sometimes there is a more a, a, sometimes you approach it and sometimes you distance a little bit and make different decisions. But uh, that's that's the way we, we are seeing. So w we help entrepreneurs to take these decisions and balance and, and, and create a spiral a little bit more with these different strategies. Yeah, I know. You, you said it. I mean, there's absolutely nothing wrong with win-win. Everybody's mm -hmm. doing it. And housing being such a capital intensive, you know, business um, that, you know, you, you got to let 
you know, you got to look at it from a sustainable, economic sustainable mm -hmm. basis. Otherwise, you know, it may not work. Appreciate that. Thank you. Hopefully, I'll have another question for you later on. But let me let me jump to uh, Lewam. Lewam, if you're, if you're there, I mean, on, on the, following the, the same train of thought, I mean, uh, how does village capital support entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs, um, and, and, and innovators to uh, find fresh resources, capital sources from investors? I mean, what is it that you do? And let me do a follow-up to that as well so you can expand. Um, uh, what other support services you provide them with to, in order to, for them to scale up? So not only find the capital, but also to get them to a larger scale business. That was for Lewin. I, there you are. There you go. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> no worries. Yeah, sure. So we have an approach where we find, train, and invest in entrepreneurs. So we are working primarily with um, entrepreneurs that are targeting specific problems. So as it relates to shelter tech, we have an investment readiness curriculum program that really helps them refine uh, the business that they're building, think through like the sustainability and uh, potential profitability um, and market impact as well as social impact. Uh, we have our own internal uh, proprietary uh, investment readiness framework that we call viral to help businesses sort of assess what the kind of funding they should be raising when. Um, we also leverage our extensive mentor network, both in terms of industry experts and in terms of other investors that are looking at the space to connect um, our entrepreneurs to capital. Uh, we also invest in um, some of the startups that come out of our work, and we do that using flexible instruments, actually, which really helps when you're targeting different kinds of business models. So not only chasing um, convertible debt, safes, or equity. We're also looking at things like revenue share and debt that could be better for more sustainable businesses that are not necessarily super high growth ventures or not matching that um, hockey stick expectation of growth, um, but are still providing a significant amount of impact. Well, that's interesting. That's very interesting. Um, Great, I, and I do have another question for you, but I want to make sure that everybody gets gets a fair share, and then we will get back to you on that. Uh, but obviously, fascinating, and it's just the, the fact that we all working on the capital side of things uh, it makes me very very happy because uh, that's what we need, I think, most. Anyway, Johan, uh, your turn now, and uh, you you bring a, a very unique perspective as a private uh, foundation. Uh, and the question is, how does the Healthy Foundation? strengthen the, the public and private supply chain uh, to improve processes of uh, self-built homes in vulnerable communities. You mentioned uh, an example in Colombia, but if, if there's anything else that you want to add to that. Thanks, Alex. Um, I, I, I think the, uh, the example from Colombia is probably the best example where we um, demonstrated over 10 years that we can build a, a strong relationship between public and private partners in a I finished my presentation on the note that I could continue to speak about the specific role of corporate foundations. And I think um, this is essential when, when we look at your question. Um, as a corporate foundation, I feel uh, we can take a specific role in bridging the private sector and the business sector, um, especially when we look at a foundation like the Hilti Foundation where, where the connections are close between the, the corporate side and the, and the philanthropic side. Uh, we have very good connections with our headquarters. We sit in the same office, but we also work with all of our, our country offices worldwide. So um, when I speak with our partner organizations of the foundations around of the foundation around the world, they usually tell me how hard it is for them to get find an entry point into businesses to work with uh, with the established corporate sector. I feel this is where, where corporate foundations like ourselves can make a difference and um, trying to um, leverage the context that we have both into the business world and into the public sector through, through our established business and making um, or providing access through our networks for our nonprofit partners. Um, one specific example might be Scott and Lewa mentioned both um, the Andean Tech Accelerator um, and the industry partners that are providing um, mentorship and leadership for the startups. Uh, we managed to um, 
to create a scheme together with Habitat for Humanity uh, and our corporate partners of Hilti that we um, provide Hilti mentors for each of the startups that come with their view from the business side with all the experience in market analysis, in uh, marketing, in business operations, uh, and try to support startups from this, um, from this perspective. And they feel um, the, the foundation uh, had, a, um, had an important role in drawing this connection between our partners on the nonprofit side and, uh, and the Hilti business. So this might be another example of how we leverage connections between the private sector, uh, the third sector, but also the, the public sector. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. And again, very unique perspective. And I appreciate when you talk about grants, we can't forget that that's money you don't give back. That's money you don't expect a return on. And it's the fact that you, you your corporation is willing to do that and the foundation is it's laudable. Thank you very much for that. Um, and congratulations on the 80th uh, anniversary of your company. Uh, we'll celebrate another time. Uh, Scott, back to you, if uh, you don't mind, another follow-up question for uh, TCIS. Um, and, and building on, on the initial question, I mean, what, what are some of the critical factors that, that you look uh, for entrepreneurs uh, in order for them to be able to scale up uh, and make their company sustainable? What's your, what's your perspective on it? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I think it's it's probably a bit of a cliche to to say it's it's about the team, uh, but that is really, I think, uh, really quite important in terms of any individual um, startup and and its success, and they're being committed to to the program and being, um, you know, I would say also committed to. Uh, to the impact side of things, right? I think we, as I said in in the the my talk, that you we see construction, we see innovation and construction happening at the higher end. That's where most of that happens. At that lower end and the affordable housing sector, which we're interested in, um, you don't see that. And so having a a committed team who has not just a a growth mindset, but a an impact mindset as well is is really essential. Uh, yeah, I, I hear I hear that and I second that. I, I've been around quite a few years managing teams of people, and you got to recognize that the biggest asset any company has, and that's where you need to grow. Appreciate that. That's that's a good insight, Scott. Thank you. Um, back to Maori now. One more question for you. Um, and again, you mentioned three companies that you're working with in Brazil. I'm just curious if there's one in particular, it could be one of those three or something in particular you've seen in a company that just blows your mind that, that you think, wow, this is just incredible how they can improve lives and the housing conditions in informal neighborhoods. Is there one in particular you want to expand on or two if you have? I'm just curious. Oop, you're muted, I think. Oh, yeah. We have a company that called Vivenda that we work with since the beginning, uh, since it was almost an idea. It, it is a home improvement company, and they realize that it's a very complex pro problem to offer re uh, home improvement. So uh, we created, a, they created an accelerator to accelerate home improvement companies. And we are the pipeline, so our coalition, we are the pipeline for, for their accelerator and we are helping as well. And we are creating a network of home improvement companies. So they are small businesses, uh, but united, they can create a, a, a huge impact. So Vivenda mm -hmm. sell a, a big, uh, like can close big deals. And these all networks of home improvement companies that are in the communities, they offer the services. So I think it's very interesting model. Great, great, great. Appreciate it. I think we're, we're about to, uh, we need to close right now. Unfortunately, I thought we could uh, throw a couple more questions to Johan and Lewan, but we need to stop. I appreciate everybody's support and uh, everybody's particip participation and uh, been great seeing you and looking forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you.